Between Hegel's death in 1831 and Marx's earliest philosophical writings in 1841, Europe had been completely transformed. In, in France, you had the first uprisings of the proletariat where they were appointing their own leaders rather than tagging along behind one or another liberal politician. And in Britain, you have the Chartist movement, again, where poor working class people self-organised, usually smashed up the next day by police infiltrators, but nevertheless, they wrote their own programs, they petitioned Parliament. In Hegel's day, it was taken for granted by everyone the, the, there was a class of people that were involved in culture and society and political life that had to solve the social problems and the social problems were what the rabble were up to. You know, and if the rabble went on the rampage uh, or stole or committed crime, this was a social problem. Right? But there was no conception at that time that the rabble could actually create history. In the ten years of the 1830s, that got turned upside down because uh, real representatives of the proletariat came forward and said, these are the ideas we're fighting for. Uh, we want you know, universal suffrage if we're in England, or we want something else, whatever, in France. So Hegel's philosophy was suddenly completely outmoded. Um, why that should be so isn't immediately obvious. But uh, um, a whole system that, that said that everything was a realisation of the idea just doesn't stand up when uh, the people that are excluded and uneducated and illiterate and don't participate in the political life um, are, are, are driving history any longer. And um, a whole um, range of, of critiques of Hegel started to become, come forward. Um, for example, Hegel took the workers and the capitalists together as the business class. And in political life, the business class was represented, of course, by the wealthy business people. He, he assumed that workers would be proud to see the products that they had made circulating on the market at a good price. Never occurred to him that they might feel exploited by that. Right? He took the peasants uh, together with the, the arist landed aristocracy as part of the agricultural class. And of course, the landed aristocracy formed the feudal nobility that would have the responsibility of, of providing a head of state. The, the peasants may have some problem with their exploitative landlord having a divine right of kings flowing to them. Never occurred to him. Right? He was concerned about social problems, and he wanted to. He fully recognised the social contradictions were there, but these were the responsibility of the educated and wealthy to solve. What well, Marx was born into a period where these problems were going to be solved by the people getting themselves organised, and it required a completely different philosophy. It wasn't a question of thought forms realising themselves now, but of, of activity, of actually making history and building the culture and the society, uh, uh, expressing itself in the form of ideas. Now, Hegel was really the original constructivist, so, social constructivist par excellence, by which I mean, for Hegel, everything was a social construct. Uh, he, he did nothing simply, not even being itself, uh, existed sort of objectively and eternally. Everything was a social product. But he thought that nature was eternal. Nothing new ever happened. Nothing new under the sun in nature. Right? So he made an absolute dichotomy between nature and culture. Right? And that absolute dichotomy between nature and culture led him astray. He believed that nature was intelligible, but he didn't think that anything ever really changed. In his last years, he, he, you know, he got to see that continents you know, were born, and, and this came into problems. You know? But he absolutely rejected the evolution of species. He, knew, he didn't know Darwin, but he, he knew Lamarck, and he rejected it, because nothing new happens in nature. What this meant was that he took the human body and the differences between the genders and the difference between the races and the different sort of physiognomy of, of, of the wealthy classes and the poor as given by nature, and that therefore he had to explain them as logically necessary. Right? And, and this, uh, in fact, leads to a complete uh, justification of the status quo. Uh, it also, uh, like almost every philosopher you come across, is driven by the necessity of building a system. And at a certain point, while most, a lot of the ideas I've talked about now are particularly characteristic of the young Hegel, um, later on the system 
uh, with its arcane logical triads and so on, is all you see. Uh, and it became very rigid. Now, uh, the, these kind of points were made by Marx. Um, but I, I, I want to look at a, a series of specific texts by Marx to elaborate on this. The first one is, in fact, um, the thesis on Feuerbach. The thesis on Feuerbach wasn't published until after Marx's death. It was just some dot points he wrote on a scrap of paper. But for anyone that wants to study activity theory, they're profoundly important. I mean, I, I read, reread the thesis on Feuerbach. It's about a page and a half, at least annually. Uh, and I'll go on reading it and read. It's just so rich. And I can only just touch on a few things here. But first, before we get to this, I want to uh, ask where Marx would have got the concept of activity from. Because in the thesis on Feuerbach, the, the notion of activity looms very large. It's where uh, it comes into our tradition of thinking. Activity begins firstly with Herder, who introduced it as a critique of Spinoza's mechanical concept of nature. He says, nature is active, striving, full of contradictions. Right? After Herder, uh, Fichte, Fichte, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who is uh, also a critic of Kant, he introduced the idea of activity in this sense to overcome the dichotomy between subject and object. Because Fichte pointed out that if I do something, right, an act, that is both subject, subjective and objective. It's subjective because I've decided to do it and I do it. And, and you don't have any activity other than a purposive activity. Someone delivered to, but it's also objective. Right? It, it's something that happens in the material world outside consciousness. If it doesn't, then you haven't had activity. Right? So what Fichte did is he built uh, a theory of the ego as pure activity. And he reconstructed a whole theory of the world and politics and ethics and everything on the basis of, of the ego as pure activity. Then there was uh, after Fichte, a follower of Fichte, uh, Moses Hess, who uh, became known as an ultra-left uh, communist and later a Zionist, uh, not so ultra-left, uh, but he was a, he, he, when Marx decided to get into communism, uh, give up his study of Greek philosophy and become a communist, and he went to Paris, and Hess was the person that really introduced him to um, communism. And one of uh, Hess's books is The Philosophy of the Deed, Philosophy der Tat. And Tat as deed is the same uh, root as Tätigkeit, which is the German word for activity. So basically he says, look, the, the philosophy or the world isn't about so many beings, it's about doings. Right? We should, uh, if, if we're going to be uh, liberators, if we're going to be communists, if we're going to be freedom, then our foundation is not what is, but uh, doing things. Right? So uh, Hess invited Marx to make activity the foundation of his philosophy. And th this is where Thesis on Feuerbach comes from. Now, w what you see in, in Thesis on Feuerbach is Marx emphasizes activity. And f straight off from Thesis 1, he says it's the idealists that have always emphasized the active side. And, and this distinction he makes here between what the idealists have done and what the materialists have done is really important. He says, the materialists say men are products of their conditions, forgetting that it is human beings that make those conditions. He says, what the materialists do in making human beings passive uh, products of their circumstances is that they split society in two. You have the masses there who are products of their conditions, and then you have us teachers here, people who are in the know, who then can manipulate this. Right? But for the tasks of, of self-emancipation, that's clearly inadequate and reactionary. At the same time, you see he's using the concept of activity to critically appropriate Hegel's thinking. Right? Because instead of being a spirit which realizes itself, and I mean, I've not emphasized this in the way I've given you Hegel, because I want to give you a Hegel which is already, in a sense, ready for use uh, in, in, in psychology. But instead of it being uh, ideas that create or drive activity, 
in our thinking we can only reflect activity that's actually going on as individuals. We can grasp and when we're talking about our thinking I mean their theoretical thought. Right? Of course we're always thinking about what we're doing but if we want to understand what's going on we don't just think about ideas, we have to observe and watch and grasp the activity that's going on. And he says in fact that all mysteries find their rational solution in human practice and the comprehension of this practice. So the, the famous uh, criticism that Marx makes of Feuerbach here is this. Feuerbach wrote a book called Essence of Christianity in which he takes a series of concepts from the Christian religion such as the Holy Family and says look this is nothing but taking what exists here on earth and sticking it up in heaven for us all to admire. Right? And so these people are doing something so they imagine well God told us to do this. Right? It's not me that wants to you know, blow up your building, God told me to, it's in the Quran, whatever, or it's in the Bible or whatever it is. Right? So Feuerbach thinks that by showing this, by exposing religion to be nothing more than a rationalisation of the way society is, that he's going to solve the problem. That people say, oh, I see, God is just a product of my mind, it's not real. Oh, damn, why didn't you tell me? And Marx says, you're joking. Religion is there for a reason. Ideas arise out of real social contradictions. If you want to liberate women, instead of marching around saying liberate women, liberate women, liberate women, women are just as good as women, what about equal pay? And then women will have a choice. Right? So you have to change the social conditions which give a rise to a particular contradiction or form of oppression by whatever means is available, which may include proposing ideas right? and, and engaging in ideological critique. But when you uh, can change the form of activity in which people are involved, then the ideas will, 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 will form themselves, people will be able to observe. So for instance, you want to teach children about science, start off by getting them involved in some scientific practice and, and in thinking about what they're doing and you're on the first step. Right? Don't just lecture people on the general principles. So that's not scientific, why not? You know? uh, take people through the practice and then so the, the mysteries are resolved first in human practice and then by the comprehension of that practice. Uh, now in those 11 points, all, I mean I can't deliver them to you here, but please take your time and go over them. Now around about the same time Marx and Engels together wrote a vast manuscript uh, which is really for the purpose of self-clarification, uh, consigned as they said to the, the rats uh, and never published this one paragraph which I find very informative. The premises from which we begin are not arbitrary ones, not dogmas, but real premises from which abstraction can be made only in the imagination. They are the real individuals, their activity and the material conditions under which they live, both those they find already existing and those produced by their activity. These premises can thus be verified in a purely empirical way. So these are the foundations of any social science, cultural historical activity theory included. And you just recapitulate these real individuals as opposed to, for instance, just so stories, yeah? uh, like moral stories about how it all got going or one time there was a man running into another man and they made a pact and decided to set up government or any of this kind of stuff, mythology. No, real individuals as they actually are today and here. Their activity. Here I, I think we're just talking about a generalised conception of activity. Yeah. And material conditions. Material conditions uh, should be understood here uh, very generally not uh, restricted as it is for some people to productive activity or economic activity. It includes the, the available language, includes the land, includes buildings, machinery, uh, the condition of the, the human body itself. Material condition includes human bodies. If the people are all filled with disease and starving, there are limits to what you can do culturally. Right? And Marx basically says this is all we're going to assume. And, and we want to appropriate from Hegel and Goethe, Herder, this uh, approach to understanding the whole, 
that our premises will just be individual, real individuals, their ac actual activity, and the material conditions under which, which they work. Okay. They're the only assumption. No assumption about laws of history. Right? No mention of laws of history. No mention of laws of nature right? or dialectics of nature. Right? No, no mention of capitalism here. Right? There's premises, that's where I start from. And they're very general premises and just as good for cultural psychology today as they were for Marx in 1845. Uh, we have a bit of discussion on that. Can people see the connection between this and the, the way I've uh, explained Hegel? Yeah? Marx doesn't write philosophy really. The, <coughs> the little bits of philosophy that we get are usually things that have been dug out of his drawer after he died. Um, such as the ones we're looking at just now. Um, so we don't really know for sure uh, where he gets things, but we, we know he was an aficionado of Hegel before he left home. You know? So we have the mediation here. Yep. The but they're, yeah. Yeah, they're all mediating each other. Individuals, yeah, the individuals are mediating uh, material conditions and activity by actually doing them, overcoming the barriers of the material conditions <laughs> and finding an activity which is viable. Etc. Material conditions are there in order to allow people to do those things which they're doing. So again, it's a, a he's, he's restoring in a way that's uh, quite explicit uh, Hegel's idea of a formation of consciousness. But it's not a formation of consciousness. I mean, give us a break, you know. I mean, these are real people actually doing things in material conditions. So he stripped away a lot of that. Uh, stuff that made Hegel, certainly to, uh, to us today, quite inaccessible. Well, I have to say, in the 1830s and 40s in Germany, people knew exactly what Hegel was about. And if you read the comments of young Hegelians at that time, uh, they were not mystified by Hegel at all. They, they understood it as highly political and highly practical. But times have changed, and, and to us now it's very arcane. Yes? I'm just uh, I'm thinking, because so, at the beginning you talk about Yes. And here is Marx, but actually there are differences, right? Yes. So here, I remember one slide talking about, I think they are four at the mm. That is Deckers, right? Yes, yes. But for Marx, it's opposite, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, different. I am, therefore, I think. Yes. So it's kind of material conditions. Yes. So mentioned everything happened is material objects first, and then so. There are some problems, so I need to solve this problem. So that is, uh, I'm thinking about that. So this individual, individual thinking, but based on this problem, based on this object. So this part, process of the thinking and uh, solve this problem, and it comes up the new concept for me, and mm. then these things. Yes. And something is different from that class, right? It is different, yes. Yeah, so I just think of the beginning you talked about Descartes. Mm. And then here is Marx. Mm. So why they, you know, the different thinking. Yeah, okay. Descartes, um, we have to start from because that is historically the real beginning of philosophy, Western philosophy and the science of consciousness in particular. And we can't, uh, it's an unfortunate thing that, that Nowadays, people are taught philosophy uh, really by being put onto Deleuze and Derrida right away. You know? and, and how can they, people possibly understand these things if they don't know the hundreds of years of history behind them? So, M Marx perfectly well accepted, with due modification, what Descartes had said. It didn't need to be repeated. Thought and matter are two different things. He was not deluder in that respect. Um, Descartes was not an idealist. He, he said, I think, therefore I am. It's simply, he's saying that's the only thing that's certain. It was a, an expression of his scepticism. He doesn't mean by that that, that thinking is the basis of existence, right? which is how it's often taken today. That's not what it meant. Re, if you read it in context, he's, he's saying, I, there's nothing there I can trust. All I know is that I exist, because otherwise I couldn't even ask this question. Right? So he, he's not setting out an idealist um, 
uh, theory of, of, of the world in doing it. He's not an idealist at all. He's quite practical. Remember, this is the guy that worked out the trajectory of cannonballs, you know, by uh, uh, project the coordinate geometry. Very practical, right? But the, the point is that the ideas are, can have a truth, tr can give us insight. Right? But he, he wanted us not to just accept things blindly, but to be critical. And, and in that, that spirit, um, Marx was 100%. Marx differed a little bit in the sense because Descartes was at the very beginning, he said, throw it all out. Don't care what Aristotle says. Don't care what Aquinas says. It's all rubbish. Forget about it. Let's start now. What do I know now? All I know is that I exist. Now, where can we go from there? Now, a couple of hundred years down the road, Marx is a little bit the same in terms of he's going right back to the beginning of communist theory and rethinking things through, but at the same time he's able to draw upon a couple of hundred years of development of philosophy and social thinking before him. He, he, he's gone to Paris, he's talked to people like Moses Hess, he's talked to uh, the French socialist utopians, he's talked to Proudhon and Bakunin, right? He, he's very much aware that the individual doesn't just create an idea out of nothing, that ideas uh, exist in society and through participation in social practices you develop your ideas. Right? So that's a difference. Is that okay? But I think if we just start off with that, you, you have people uh, will easily get the idea that, that uh, you know, thinking doesn't involve the head. Right? Because Marx doesn't talk about that. He took it for granted. Right? The, the Descartes Descartes led us down a wrong alley by posing the problem of knowledge as a problem of ontology. But there's still a basic true thought in what he said, and that true thought is sublated into everything that happened afterwards. But Goethe, through the mouthpiece of Faust, says, Im Anfang war der Tat, in the beginning was the deed. Right? Which picks up on the point you're making. Yeah? You do something first and then see what happens. Yeah. Understand what you did, yeah. the human practice, and the comprehension of that practice. Okay, uh, moving on, just read this little quote that I've put on the PowerPoint here. This is 1857 in the midst of um, Marx's uh, study of political economy and the history of political economy. It says, the concrete is the concentration of many determinations. It appears in the process of thinking, therefore, as a process of concentration as a result, not as a point of departure, even though it is the point of departure in reality. What he means by this is that if you're going to develop an adequate theory of e economics, for example, to understand this immensely complex thing, which is modern society with all its credit and its banks and its crises and its manufacturing and its trade and colonialism and everything else. That, of course, you'll start off with all that myriad of different concrete things going on, but you'll never understand from there. What you have to do is work your way through that to get uh, the abstract concepts uh, that, that has that society, that form of life has generated to understand itself. And, and you, ha you have to uh, identify those abstract concepts and then work your way from those abstract concepts and reconstruct in thought the concrete reality that you see before you. Right? Now those con that, that, that concrete reality with all the myriad of different activities and a flow of sense impressions um, isn't constructed out of concepts. In the process of theorizing it though, you have to begin with the abstract. The abstract which has been produced by historical development of that form of life. And then you reconstruct it because you can apprehend uh, a complex process like modern society in all its diversity only through th thoughts, that is to say concepts. So you have to first identify the abstract concepts, and you don't pull these abstract concepts out of a, you know, a book or your head or somewhere, or think you do, 
um, but they are generated by the object itself. So in order to understand the form of life, you have to, you, you know, if you want to understand some, say, foreign form of life, you don't begin with a dictionary of anthropology and say, oh, okay, T for tribal, here we are, here's what. No, you have to find the ideas that that form of life itself produces and then reconstruct all the diversity of actual life that's going on there in terms of those concepts. Does that make sense? And that's often referred to as the ascent from the abstract to the concrete. So you get to the abstract idea, sort through, find the, the abstract ideas, and then you ascend to the concrete again. Huh? So it's very important to, to start with these abstract concepts. Yeah. Yes. She talks about rising to a yes. and a right. double moon, if you like. Yes. yes. Yeah. Which okay. is exactly what that, that's saying. what she's talking about. And it's the section three of the introduction to the Grundrisse. Right? It's, a, it's in the sections called the method of political economy. Okay? Uh, it's the, the, the move from the concrete to the, the abstract, that's a real process of development of the science itself. Marx points out that the concept of exchange value was known to Aristotle. Right? But in Aristotle's time, because you didn't have a developed capitalist economy, exchange value was just an abstract and rather meaningless and secondary concept. It didn't seem to have anything to it. But by the time you get to, the, to Marx's day, with the development of colonialism and trade and so on, uh, that concept of exchange value has become extremely rich. It's been the subject, for instance, of study by um, Adam Smith, uh, Ricardo, and a whole range of other political econ economists. So in starting with, the, the, this is still an abstract concept like exchange value, um, but it's the development of activity itself has enriched that abstract concept. So it's possible to draw out of that a lot more than was possible for Aristotle. You know, who could just see abstract thing, exchange value. Right, so this is again a way Marx is showing that the thinking process isn't just something that, that is the product of either of mind in some objective generality or of a subjective human being. The development of abstractions is, is a process that goes on in the world itself. Uh, abstract ideas reflect the existence of abstract forms of activity. It, abstract forms of activity, that, that can have many different meanings, but for instance, unless you have uh, theoretical theoreticians able to pull out an idea like exchange value and discuss it and look at it or something, then you won't have that. Now, I'm going to go sort of back one page here. In the preface, the first preface to Capital, uh, Marx is quite explicit. He says every beginning is difficult, and for 2,000 years people have tried to understand this thing, say economics, and have failed. And in, in a direct allusion to Hegel and Goethe, he says, but in bourgeois society the commodity form of the product of labour, or the value form of the commodity, is the economic cell form. I said it's a direct uh, allusion to Goethe, because in his time, the, the, not long after the discovery of the cell, the cell is understood as the Ur phenomenon of a plant. Right? So he's saying that in the exchange of commodities, you have what Goethe called the Ur phenomenon, what Hegel called the concept of bourgeois society. Bourgeois society, um, Bürgergesellschaft, um, sometimes translated as civil society, means all that part of life which is around uh, business and production and trade and so on, it, apart from family and the state. Not that they're separate, but it's referring to a specific form of life, which is uh, you know, capitalist life. The notion of it is exchange of commodities. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. If you can understand that and follow through its ramifications and use your eyes, watch and see how the ramifications of doing something for someone who will do something in return, how that plays out in practice, then you see it all. You'll see colonialism, you see banks, credit, and everything. So in writing Capital, the first chapter is about the commodity. Now, he, he regretted the fact that 
none of his friends could understand him. They were very frustrated and he had several goes round to write that first chapter over a period of about six years and, and people couldn't grasp it. It just seemed to be the upside down way to go around. I mean, one reason, in a modern capitalist economy, including in 1867, there wasn't any exchange of commodities going on. That's something that even happened, you know, among the, the ferals, you know, with their lech programs or something. Uh, or, you know, in, in far reaches of you know, a peasant village or something, because they lived in a money economy. But this is the first strange thing, that the earth phenomenon, or the cell of bourgeois society, is actually something that's so simple it doesn't even go on any longer. Right? And it's, it's true that if, if Goethe had thought through his earth phenomenon a bit longer, you, you'd realise that you can't actually have an image that doesn't have any particularity to it at all. You can't draw a plant that has no shape, no size, no colour. Right? Um, and the, you could contradict what I, I just said by saying, well, money is a commodity. And, and that's right, that, that's the solution to the puzzle. That if, if everything is around money in a capitalist economy, uh, then that explains how the commodity can be the germ cell. But if you just say it's all about money, then you really fail to understand the thing, because then it just raises, well, what is money? You know? By saying that the, the, the germ cell is exchange of commodities, then what you have is a person A, a person B, and they exchange commodities. They have a relationship that is mediated by a product of one person's labour being uh, meeting the needs of another person and being paid for in like magnitude. Right? And so out of that cell, which includes it, real people, uh, artefacts, that is to say things they produce, that form a mediating relation between them in a specific practice. Right? Uh, out of that is the whole of, of capital. Uh, and that's the main book that Vygotsky studied in preparing himself for founding his... He said, um, we have to write the dust capital of psychology. So that's what he meant. We had to do what Marx did in capital. What did Marx do in capital? Well, it took him 24 years to get to that point, but he identified what was the simple, single, little, visible, empirical thing, activity, the, out of which the whole business unfolded, and that's exchange of commodities. Right? So that's a typical, it's like an archetype for how a science is to be built. Just one example of um, where Marx takes this. He says that in the first, first chapter on the commodity, he says, the secret of the expression of value, namely that all kinds of labour are equal and equivalent, because, and so far as they are human labour in general, cannot be deciphered until the notion of human equality has already acquired the fixity of a popular prejudice. This, is, this however, is possible only in a society in which the great mass of the produce of labour already takes the form of commodities, in which, consequently, the dominant relation between person and person is that of owners of commodities. So, He's saying how this ethical principle, very fundamental principle of ethics, both makes capitalist economy comprehensible because you couldn't make sense of the whole idea of value unless you were able to grasp the idea of the inherent, innate equality of human life. Right? Saying that that idea could not arise except in a society dominated by exchange of commodities at their value. So this reflects, I think, very profoundly how Marx is able to take out of a very simple cell the exchange of commodities, uh, some very profound insights. One of the other things, one of the few explicit uh, ventures into uh, psychology that Marx has is this concept of fetishism. That he says that, that when people are parted from their product of labour and it goes onto the market, it appears to acquire human power. Huh? It has, a, it has a, like a power and path of its own, and it dominates. I mean, working class people produce wealth, but they are enslaved by that wealth. They have created a rod for their own back. And it, un, un, unless people are, are scientifically reflective, and I mean, probably that's the majority of, of cases today to some degree, but normally, if people don't think deeply about what's going on in their lives, they tend to um, 
impute human powers into objects, right? like such as a, a hundred dollar bill. And God says, great, this will do this and that for me. Right? So th th this is, uh, he calls it a fetish because of course it's a direct allusion to religi religious uh, societies where icons and crosses and various things are imbued with spiritual power. In a capitalist economy, we imbue spiritual power in things. We allow them to, to tell us what we should do in our lives and we give them great power. Um, and if you think again that this is something again of very profound psychological significance, that, that we create things, we put them out in the world, and once they become part of the world, that separate from us, then they, they appear to ha have human qualities. Um, we'll just have a bit of a talk about that and then I'll finish up. Are you okay with this? Okay, okay, I'll go on. But one other um, thing which I want to look into um, is the, the only really extended treatment of a overtly political or historical subject that Marx did was the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. And this is a, uh, an analysis of the events in France um, leading up to the 1848 revolution. I've got an abbreviated version of the quote here. Men make their own history, but under circumstances given and transmitted from the past, the tradition of all the dead de generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. They anxiously conjure up spirits of the past, borrowing from them names, battle slogans and costumes. And just to elaborate on this, this is how Marx sees political activity. You have a personage, some public figure, and they attempt to uh, present themselves with a certain costume and take on, use certain words, refer to, you know, talk about the diggers, you know, working families and all these, these sort of buzzwords and so on, in order to present themselves uh, in, in, a, in a dramatic way. Right? So they draw on a whole stock of, of existing narratives and attempt to cast themselves into one of the roles in this narrative. Then the general public around witness that and they, according to a number of factors, they can identify that and decide to participate in that drama and uh, you know, vote for them, go along with them, throw stones at you know, immigrants or whatever it is that the person is asking them to do. Uh, so this is interesting because Although Marx goes on in his talk to talk about different layers of French society and what they did, when you look at it, it's something like about 20 different uh, groups that he talks about. He talks about young people and old people, about small peasants and artisans and, and the liberal politicians and the radicals. And so the, the groupings of people that participated in those revolutionary struggles are very diverse. Marx was not someone that believed that just because of your relation to the means of production, to use a good old orthodox cliche, uh, that therefore determined your ideas and your uh, political trajectory. If you're a wage worker, then you're going to be a socialist. This is something utterly foreign to Marx. Yeah? Marx, uh, although he, you know, he, he, he didn't build a whole theory and give us a dust capital of politics, right? We just have to go on what few things he did write. The word semiotics didn't exist in those days. Um, the, it seems to me, though, that, that Marx's ideas of, of, of social life were very much uh, semiotic ones, and that uh, the tendency to somehow corral Marx uh, into some kind of economic determinism was very mistaken. It was mistaken then, it was not based on these works, and it was very ridiculously mistaken now. Economics, of course, is a, a principal important uh, part of all our activity. One must eat first before you can play music. Yeah? But our political life uh, is determined in this complex semiotic way. And the, the, the semiosis of economic life, the, the creation of products of labour, which then enter on into the market, is just one aspect of, of that semiotic regulation of social life. Um, okay, we've got a good 10 minutes. 
um, what would we like to look at? While we're thinking about it, I've concentrated on um, the origins of cultural historical activity theory in the German Romanticism and classical German philosophy. But I don't want to give the impression that that's the only source of cultural historical activity theory in Vygotsky's ideas. So this diagram here, which you can find on the internet, gives you some idea of the diversity of sources. In addition to the uh, German philosophy, you had um, also uh, a great uh, school of, of linguistics and hermeneutics in Russia, uh, which also had its origins in uh, German classicism, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt and, um, and Herder and Schleiermacher. But it was a very strong tradition, very powerful, and, and that's really where Vygotsky got his initial training, uh, Gust Gustav Spett and a follower of Batebna. So linguistics is a part of it. Another important source is American pragmatism. Uh, there was direct contact between Vygotsky and the Americans. Um, the, the, I've mentioned Mead already with his interpretation of Hegel. Uh, Pierce, fantastic, uh, semiotics and pragmatism. And uh, William James, uh, in his very first recorded intervention, Vygotsky quotes James as a uh, behavioural a social behaviourist as a counter to the dominant physiological behaviourism in Russia at the time. Also fr French sociology, very powerful tradition beginning with um, uh, Rousseau, uh, Durkheim, uh, Henri Bergson and others, uh, the anthropologists such as Marcel Mauss, who also can trace themselves back to Herder's work, and also a German science uh, here, including the Gestaltist, but people like Wilhelm Wundt, um, and, uh, and those ger great tradition of German science, particularly from the latter part of the 19th century, um, which looked into the physiology of, of uh, the human nervous system and so on, and um, they trained uh, James, for instance. There's a direct connection between them and the Americans as well. Uh, so th th they're the, the main influences, but the, the German philosophy that I've introduced you to is historically the first and, and really important, but uh, there, are, there are other sources, the Americans, the French, German science, Russian uh, linguistics and hermeneutics particularly. Um, okay, any other questions please? Challenge me. Yes. Bogotsky himself says it's no good just to look at the finished product. Yeah? You have to see the whole process by which you arrive. For me, I only discovered Herder really um, about six months ago. And I couldn't believe what I was reading. You know? He said, 1770 something, and he's writing thinking as working with symbols. You know? A Schwerpunkt, which is now known as the leading activity. Yeah? The latest sort of discovery of activity theory you know, today. Uh, and there he was writing about this in 1780 or something, you know. Uh, and then um, the, how can I put it, when he, I see, you know, you see the connection there with the, the concept of activity. Now, you know, I don't know if you know Leontief, but Leontief's concept of activity is very much like little sort of organisms are active. And, and, and he tries to, to derive um, properties of human life by following the early forms of life up. Now, I didn't like that because I go a bit with Marx, real individuals, you know, and forget about nature, let's look at real individuals. But at the same time, when you think, well, what is activity? Well, um, uh, uh, it's difficult to explain. Does it include things you do unconsciously? You know? So to really get to an understanding of what activity is, it's really helpful to see it began with this conception of nature. 
Yeah? Yeah. And nature is active, full of contradictions, striving, opposing forces. Just a very generalised concept then. And so in a sense, Leontief's concept of activity, where he introduces it from uh, organic nature, and of course goes through in Leontief's work a sharp change when he gets to human life because things are mediated by artefacts. Right? So that's when you, I mean, you go uh, from Goethe uh, to Hegel, and Hegel is uh, the big break there is instead of seeing humanity and nature as the basic polarity, he's looking at, at, at human beings in our own nature, yeah, in our, our culture. So I, I agree, and it's been a, a wonderful um, learning process for me when I've discovered the, the history behind these ideas. But initially, you just have to take them. Mm. It's been very nice, useful because, like uh, Hegel's work, and also uh, seeing the work of Leontief, it's really hard to you know, understand for us. Um, and, uh, yeah, for me, when we reading some, yeah, there are articles. It's really hard to understand. It, it is hard to understand. Yeah. 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 Look, I, I'm not in a position to um, do research programs with ch you know, childhood learning or anything. I'm just not able to do that. My circumstances have never. I've been just that kind of thing is ruled out for me. But I do have the opportunity to sit at home and sweat sometimes week after week with some arcane bit of ancient German theory, you know, and, and, and crack it, you know, and then I can say, hey, look, this is what he was talking about. Yeah. But I still have a question yes. about concepts. Yes. Because in the triangle of things, it's particular individual and universal. Yes. For the concept is, uh, we talk about individual, uh, to think or pick up the particular idea of universal. Yes. So that is part of the explanation of this triangle? Well, the, the individual universal particular relationship is a very abstract and general one and you can realise it in a lot of different ways, right? The thing is, unlike <laughs> Descartes, Hegel didn't proceed on the basis of, of ideas and matter, right? He basically said, well, who cares you know, about that? We understand what to do with those things that are part of our culture. Right? Th th therefore, um, can, the, sorry, I'm just trying to, to get back to why I'm saying that. The, so when we look at individual, one moment you look, he's talking about an individual thing that you're categorising as, a, as a, um, a pine tree, for instance, that you're subsuming under some uh, universal pine tree. The next moment you're looking at an idea, right? an individual thought, right? like, like my thought of a pine tree. And, and, and Hegel's not making that distinction. He's not distinguishing your thought of something and the thing itself. Because all that we do with our thoughts is we, we constitute and reflect um, the things in the world we live. Which, I mean, a pine tree is a pine tree in a sense because we, we say so. Yeah, and we, we, we plant them in plantations and we, we associate them with forests and, and goblins and, you know, uh, like, even the moon, which is nowhere near the earth, is only the moon because it figures in our, our romances, our concepts of, of things rotating around the centre. Right? So, um, the, the, he's not concerned w with the, uh, some dichotomy between an idea and a thing. Right? He takes it that the world we live in is what is given to us in our thought. His psychology, actually, when he eventually gets to psychology, is only concerned with the formation of individuality. He takes it for granted that, normally speaking, all the people working in a particular culture have ideas which are part and parcel with the world of things and activities that they live in. And he doesn't pose any kind of problematic contradiction between them. So when we're looking at individual, universal in particular, he presents it as a logical triad, a syllogism. Right? The, the classic is all men are mortal, Socrates is immortal, is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Right? And you can analyse that in terms of individual, universal, and particular. And that's how he presents it. Right? It's quite mysterious. But the point is that he sees that logical relationship uh, as the same as relationships between people and things and whatever in the world we live in. And just, um, he makes it life very difficult 
because he doesn't spell that out. Fortunately, he wrote things when he was much younger where it's easier to see what he's talking about. Right? So that enables us to decode some of his later work, which is very arcane. But with individual universe in particular, it's, I, I can give you an example. You know, like here's a, a, a lectern, individual lectern under the universal given by the word lectern because I stand in front of it and leave my notes on it, basically. Because right? I, I engage in a lectern-like practice with it. And if you turn the table on its end and I'd been able to do the same thing, that would have been the lectern. Right. But at the same time, um, I could take th this, I could take my thought of the lectern as what was playing the role of individual and go through um, and take the universal as being the word. I, I could interpret that relationship in a way that was just logical or linguistic, uh, or you can interpret it in a way that, for example, uh, plants uh, are realizations of a, of a certain genome. Right. So, uh, you can look at a relationship with an individual realization of that, that universal genome and uh, that, that forms in particular species. So you can make an interpretation of nature that way as well. So you can give it very uh, general application. In Vygotsky, uh, I tend to find the concepts of activity and mediation with artifacts is a, is a good way of realizing it, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, it, 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 if you want to work out how some distinction is realized, so is mediated, uh, then it'll be some variation on the individual universal particular relationship. Mm. The, the, although that's very sort of fuzzy and, and difficult to get your hands on that kind of thought, the other side of that is, is when you can connect to it, it opens up a whole range of, of, of different types of reflection and investigation. Mm. Because one of the, the things that, that, that uh, Goethe and this whole tradition, including Marx and Vygotsky and everything, is very dedicated to is not dividing everything into silos and disciplines. Right? All the people that I've mentioned in the talk today were multidisciplinary people. You know? Goethe, poet, natural scientist, administrator, traveller, you know? uh, heard a philosopher of history, uh, a the the theologian, <laughs> uh, really Marx, of course, a communist, a, a philosopher, a avid interest in every branch of science, and uh, Vygotsky continued studying medicine, all the things, um, all the time he was doing psychology as well, uh, art criticism, a continuing activity. And uh, th this determination always to grasp things as a whole naturally requires you. Um, to have this kind of gestaltist analysis of each individual problem you look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I'm about exhausted. Thank you very much. Um.